Welcome, or welcome back, to the UQ School of Architecture Architectural Technology courses. In this video, we will be looking at facade design principles relating to airflow. Visualising the effects of air in a space is difficult because we cannot see it. We see the effects of airflow, and perhaps we could use smoke to try and visualise the flow of air. But the best way to imagine airflow is to compare it to water. Water flowing through the effects of gravity, as say in a fast flowing stream, reveals how air can be blocked, redirected, or even stopped as a consequence of the barriers we put in its way. The aim of generating airflow through a building is to, co is to cool the occupants through evaporative cooling using the moisture on our skin. Ventilation in a building is similar to water flow, like the flow of water in a stream, cross ventilation in a building does not occur unless there is a point into and out from the building. The relative displacement of the intake and outlet valves affects the way air flows through a space. Like rocks in a stream, barriers to this flow can create places of calm and stale air. In tall buildings, the strength of wind increases the higher we go as there are less barriers to the prevailing winds. In densely built up environments, wind flowing between buildings can also significantly increase wind speeds. So for taller commercial office buildings, it is often not practical to open windows as excessive airflow can disrupt the activity inside. Therefore, the tendency for taller commercial buildings has been to exclude natural ventilation and revert to sealed internal environments. Without a way of conditioning the air, expired carbon dioxide from occupants would make internal spaces unpleasant and in extreme instances toxic. Air conditioning of internal spaces is a necessary consequence of sealing our office workplaces. Though there is a degree of recirculation of air, mechanical systems work to exhaust stale air from workspaces and mix in fresh air from outside. If we used a full fresh air system, which required conditioning, the energy use of the mechanical system would be extreme. A conditioning process that regulates the mix of recycled and fresh air is usually deployed to maximise mechanical efficiency. Though the comparison to water flow helps us understand the way airflow works, in some instances air flows differently to water, especially when it's heated. In simple terms, hot air rises. The buoyancy of air when it is heated can lift large structures and people in the air and can be used to good effect to move air inside spaces when the natural flow of air from the outside is insufficient or inconvenient. If we were at home on a hot day and we stood on a ladder to get closer to the ceiling, we would notice that the temperature higher up would be greater than that at floor level. Heat from people, equipment and solar heat gains warm the air and the hotter air tends to rise to the ceiling through natural buoyancy. This is why older houses with higher ceilings tend to feel cooler as they have less hot air trapped at circulation level and rather trap it at higher levels away from where people occupy the space. Applied to a whole building, the use of atria and chimneys can further induce the flow of air upwards through natural buoyancy. The flow of hot air upwards can have the effect of inducing airflow from below, so that if air coming in from below is cooler, we can have an effect where the flow or breeze can be induced without excessive external pressure. If we imagine an atrium filling up with hot air as if it was a hot air balloon, this pillow of air can get trapped at the higher parts of the building and then it can be exhausted away. However, we can draw upon another water analogy to visualise how hot air escapes from these trapped spaces. A full bathtub can only drain at a certain rate depending on the shape of the bath, how water is directed to the plug, the size of the plug, and perhaps a number of plugs. The natural flow rate is something we can try and control, but there are typically 
rates that water likes to flow, in the same way there are rates at which air likes to flow. For buildings that use atria and buoyancy to generate airflow inside buildings, it is important to make sure that there is a reserve of space at the top of the atria to, that is sufficiently large to hold the trapped air as a buffer and capture it while it escapes at a certain rate. The number of outlets from the atria will also increase the efficiency of how quickly hot air can escape, but we need to balance this to ensure that the whole system functions properly. If the reserve of air is high enough and large enough, then there is less risk for stale hot air to infiltrate the upper levels of a building and ensure comfortable conditions for all building users. Though building atria offer significant advantages to internal airflow, as well as increasingly important social interaction, they are not always used due to practical issues such as losses of rentable area, and sometimes fire regulations can be problematic in the use of atria. The effect of natural buoyancy though can also be used on the external facade to induce airflow up and outside the building without the problems of excessive natural airflow inside the building. The use of double facades has increased in popularity in the past two decades, especially in Europe and now in the United States and Australia. The chimney or stack effect on the outside of a building can be regulated in a number of ways to change the way that the system works seasonally and in different contexts. A stack on the external wall can also help induce airflow inside the building and help with exhausting stale air to the outside. This concludes this video outlining facade design general principles. Be sure to check in with other videos in this series.